Hello, folks. Thank you for watching. This is a video presentation called Masculine Desire in Love's Labors Lost. And this is Professor Ryan Singh Paul. Thank you again for watching, and let's get to it. So the source of this lecture, what I'm really going to be doing is uh, giving you an overview of an argument made by an author named Mark Breitenberg in his book, Anxious Masculinity in Early Modern England, which was published by Cambridge University Press in 1996. And I'm primarily going to be drawing from his chapter four, which is called The Anatomy of Masculine, in Des of Masculine Desire in Love's Labors Lost. And so the goal here is to give you a sense of his arguments as well as his methods, uh, the way he makes his arguments. So first, let's take a look at Breitenberg's um, overall thesis, the thesis that defines the book as a whole. And as he says on page one, uh, in sort of simple terms, his basic argument is that masculine subjectivity as constructed and sustained by patriarchal culture inevitably engenders varying degrees of anxiety in its male members. So what does that mean? He's arguing that there is a, an essential contradiction in male authority, in male identity that it's it has a paradox at its heart that by establishing its authority patriarchal culture thereby creates a sort of anxiety as one needs to constantly defend that authority the basis for this um, contradiction in masculine identity and masculine authority is at its root it has to do with masculine desire and this is what he says um, and he sort of developed this argument throughout the book. So I'm skipping over a lot of what he uses to build this argument up. But by chapter four, the chapter on love's labor's lost, he's come to this idea, this conclusion about masculine desire and sexual desire in particular. He says, sexual desire is a paradoxical, if not contradictory drive. It impels the masculine subject toward conquest and possession, but at the same time, it threatens to dissolve the very subject that desires in the first place. Another way to, that he puts this on the same page, which should resonate with us um, since we've studied Petrarch, is men hunt with their desire, but they are also hunted by it. So that's the paradox of masculine desire that ultimately undermines um, or creates this anxiety at the heart of masculine identity and masculine authority. So what's his argument about love's labors lost? Well, um, in this chapter, he says that love's labors lost grapples with and tries to resolve the paradoxes of masculine desire as they are exemplified in the tradition of romantic love. Let's break that down and I'll kind of go through it uh, actually backwards from the from the last statement for uh, back to get a sense of explaining what he's doing in this argument what this uh, uh, thesis means so in the tradition of romantic love so he's drawing on and making this argument in making this interpretation he's drawing on a broad historical and cultural tradition he's placing shakespeare within this context and that's more specifically the sexual culture of early modern england how they imagined romantic love what the ideas were about the proper behaviors and so forth so he's drawing on literature on history and on the sort of social imaginary the imagined um, nature of love, the way people thought about, wrote about, talked about, and behaved, practiced in terms of romantic love. When he says the paradoxes of masculine desire as they're exemplified in the tradition of masculine love, he's reading culture itself as a text. So this tradition of romantic love is a text to be read. It's a text made up of other texts. It's a text made up of poems, a text made up of biblical quotes, a text made up of behaviors, etc., etc., a text made up of laws. And so he's reading this culture and he's bringing uh, both feminist and psychoanalytic insights into the nature of subjectivity, into the nature of the self, and saying that what we see in culture is a certain paradoxical nature of masculine desire that. In this culture, as it imagined romantic love, masculine desire was paradoxical. 
the way they understood it, the way they explained it, the way they uh, anticipated and thought about it, there's a paradox in it. And when he says that Love's Labor's Lost grapples with and tries to resolve these paradoxes, and he says it's the play, not the author, Shakespeare, um, he's saying that the text works. The text is doing some sort of activity. It's not merely representing something in society, but it's taking part in culture. It's part of the, the, uh, the paradox itself. It goes into furthering the paradoxes of masculine desire, as well as trying to deal with them, trying to resolve them in the way that everyone is trying to resolve these paradoxes in their daily lives and their imaginations and their creative works, etc., etc. So he's making the argument that the text is, uh, one, it's something that, that operates, it has an activity, it's active and dynamic, not just representative, it's not just a picture, um, but it's something that works in culture, that ideology and society are always in production, right? That because a play can't just be a passive reflection of a culture, it's part of the production of that society and the ideology that it's, that it's depicting, and that the text extends beyond the individual voice of Shakespeare, that going into this play are multiple voices that Shakespeare is tapping into, um, and voices, ideas, concepts that are widely held and definitive or at least um, influential for a wide variety of people and a wide swath of the population. So what's his methodology? Well, first he gathers a number of representative texts slash contexts. And uh, what he relies on in this chapter, he, he talks about Michel de Montaigne, the essayist. He touches on the Petrarchan tradition. And of course, the main um, text that he focuses on, his main target of interpretation and analysis is Shakespeare. And then gathering those texts, he interrogates them all from um, a similar theoretical perspective, looking at what's the structure of desire that is outlined in each of these texts? How did they define male desire? How do they depict the operation of male desire? And what do they say about male identity and authority, in particular as it's defined in opposition to the woman, in opposition to femininity, the female body, etc. So gathering the texts, interrogating them all from this perspective, and then putting them in dialogue with each other, saying, well, we can see a certain trend, a certain economy, a certain structure that overlays multiple texts. So that gives us insight into a debate, a dialogue within Shakespeare's culture itself. So let's uh, first talk about Michel de Montaigne um, and why he uses Michel de Montaigne. Who he was, he was a 16th century French philosopher and essayist, um, a very brilliant writer, and he's a frequent source for Shakespeare and his contemporaries. You'll see Montaigne uh, mentioned uh, you know, all the time in Shakespeare scholarship uh, and mentioned and he's just sort of assumed as a standard context. Um, and you could go, uh, uh, it's, you could definitely do a lot worse than choosing, finding a Montaigne text to read alongside Shakespeare as a way to do a sort of cultural analysis. Why is Montaigne so popular? Um, why is he such a common text uh, and context for critical analysis of Shakespeare and other Renaissance authors? Um, partially, it's because he had such a large and diverse body of writings. He wrote um, a huge selection of essays and on just uh, basically every subject that one could possibly think about writing about in his time. Um, and his style is very self-reflective. He's very critical of himself. He's very introspective. He looks at his own thoughts and emotions in a way that um, few people today can do. Uh, so he's, uh, he's very thoughtful in his writing and that self-reflection as he examines his culture and his cultural ideas gives us a lot of insight into what an intelligent person, how they understood themselves and understood their role in the world. Um, he's often viewed as very ahead of his time as a, as a humanistic writer who, who um, even could be construed as progressive in terms of his politics and his ideals. For example, Montaigne, um, unlike many in his time, seems to acknowledge that uh, beauty is something that is culturally defined. That is, that um, 
what is what is beautiful in one culture or to one group of people is going to be different than what's beautiful to another group of people. He seems to acknowledge uh, a lot of similarities between men and women. Um, all sorts of things like this that make him seem ahead of his time and much closer in, in his mindset to modernity. And finally, he's uh, he was just so well known and popular, influential throughout Europe. Um, it's so many people knew him and, and and read him and responded to him that he's just a very useful context to any time you want to read or write about Shakespeare or anything in the period. So the essay that Breitenberg uses from Montaigne is an essay called Upon Some Verses of Virgil. Uh, so he's that's the title of the essay, but that doesn't really express what the essay actually covers. It's in Montaigne's third book of essays, um, and it was translated into English by John Florio, and it wasn't published until 1604, which would have been much later than, um, you know, approximately nine years later than Love's Labor's Lost. Although it's not necessary that Shakespeare would have read the, the text itself, that's not the argument that Breitenberg's making, but it is very likely that it was available in manuscript beforehand, and Shakespeare, uh, from uh, other evidence we have, seems to have been familiar with um, Montaigne, perhaps in the original French, um, uh, and probably in the translation by John Florio. And what the essay is, it's a long collection of stories, observations, anecdotes, uh, examples from classical literature, all sorts of things like that, on various sexual and romantic matters. So he uses all these stories as a way to kind of meditate um, and think about sex in culture. The problem that Montaigne identifies at the beginning of his essay is that sexuality, as he says, is, quote, so natural, so necessary, and so just. But we always talk about it with shame. We're always embarrassed to talk about sexuality. Um, and we talk about it in hushed tones, and we talk about it um, in, in indelicate ways when we do talk about it. Um, and there's a paradox that he identifies that the shame and the silence over the subject actually seems to incite our sexual desire and make it more violent and more passionate. And Montaigne wants to sort of empty out, as Breitenberg says, he wants to empty out the forbidden appeal of sexual discourse. He's trying to rid it of its violence and make it something that it instead is a natural, necessary, just, celebrated part of life, as opposed to something that's partially shameful and deformed by desires, etc., etc., the cause of so much suffering. Um, so that's Montaigne's goal. And he argues in this essay uh, that there are various rules of life that are imposed by men upon women, such as chastity, fidelity, modesty. These are the things that women in his culture are valued for. Um, and he says that at the same time, men are very afraid that their wives will be unchaste or unfaithful, immodest. Um, and he suggests that the rules of life that are imposed upon women simultaneously generate the fear of infidelity that we feel. So he discovers that there's a certain economy to desire, economy meaning that there's a flow, a transfer back and forth of desire, um, that it has a certain pressure to it, um, that the high value placed on female virginity inflates male desire. And I'm that's a Shakespearean pun because that means I'm talking about inflation in two or three different senses here. Um, so it creates the kind of that this high value, the intense desire for and fetishization of female virginity makes excites male anxiety, excites the 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 fear of loss of this valuable object and thus excites even further violence and imposition of violence upon women um, and the extension of that violent rule. So that's the paradox. Um, prohibition creates desire, essentially. That's the paradox that Montaigne discovers. So here's um, uh, some lines from <clears throat> Breitenberg. In these passages, Montaigne suggests that heterosexual desire among both men and women is inflamed by the inhibition or obligation placed upon women. So again, this idea of 
economy, that the pressure, the repression of desire in one arena excites desire in another. So Freud is going to come back to this a few hundred years after Montaigne, essentially. From Montaigne's male perspective, the patriarchal rules of life prescribed to the world, that's Montaigne's language, produce an erotic economy based on the valorization of female chastity, virginity, modesty, and so on. Right. So female virginity, chastity, modesty, these aren't things that are valuable in and of themselves. Right. They're not only valuable because um, or they achieve this this value in from a male perspective because men demand that women are this way. They say a good woman is chaste, virginal, modest, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So they excite, they inflate the desire for it. Right. You can think about it as. Um, any valuable object, a diamond is only valuable because people want the diamond. If they didn't want the diamond, there wouldn't be any value in it, right? So that's the same sort of thing that's going on here, the imposition of value from a male perspective on females creates the economy, creates the desire for them itself. This economy encourages male concupiscence, that's lustfulness, and paradoxically, the desire among women to transgress the restrictions placed upon them, one result of which is male jealousy or cuckoldry anxiety. So as he's saying, that there wouldn't be the desire, the lust of men for women, or the desire of women to transgress the authority of men if men didn't impose that authority on women, if men didn't decide that a woman's virginity was so valuable. It's all constructed. It's all created. And Montaigne is arguing this 500 years ago. This economy that fetishizes female chastity constructs and sustains men as desiring subjects. So that means that a man becomes a man in Breitenberg's uh, uh, argument here. A man becomes a man insofar as he participates in the economy of pursuing women, right? Of uh, of wanting a chaste female as his object of of desire. And these are desiring subjects whose identities depend upon an anxious, sometimes volatile relation to objects of knowledge and interpretation that are forever outside their mastery. The corresponding problem, you are a man insofar as you pursue a woman, however, or possess a woman, but that relationship to the object of your desire is always fraught. It's always a problematic relationship. There's always some anxiety because the woman is never fully under your control. The woman is, in fact, not an object. Um, and that's something that's sort of obliquely recognized uh, in the form of anxiety from a patriarchal perspective. Furthermore, the male subject defined by the act of desiring exists only as a desiring subject. That is, once the desire is fulfilled, or if the desire were to be fulfilled or somehow um, dispelled, then the male subject would no longer, in essence, be a man. The man who no longer chases after a woman, the man who doesn't possess a woman, the man who does not desire the chaste woman as his object is no longer a man. Um, so there's an irony that the conquest of one's desire is always um, partially feared because it's a loss of motivation to further conquest. It's a dissolution of self in the moment of uh, lustful conquest, lustful climax. The fulfillment of the desire is also a loss of desire. Once you have the thing that you wanted, then you no longer have anything to want. And of course, the thing that you have is always going to be less than satisfactory. It's never going to fulfill. Uh, it's never going to fulfill one's soul, right? And a further irony, a final irony, is that the possession of this object is also a destruction of the object, right? The woman is wanted because she is virginal, but once the woman is possessed, she loses her virginity. And that's the sort of uh, uh, great disgusting paradox and irony at the heart of patriarchal desire. 
after he talks about Montaigne, Breitenberg goes on to talk about Petrarch. And I'm not going to go too much into this because he basically just reiterates a lot of what we've already talked about in the previous Petrarch videos. So I'll uh, 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 direct you to those. But I will say a couple of things, just a couple of quotes, uh, quotations from his book that I think are important. Um, he says, regarding the economy of desire, again, the frustration of desire impels desire itself, just as in Petrarch, the inability to fully capture one subject in writing engenders more and more writing. As we saw in Petrarch, he can never fully express the woman. He cannot have her, so we must constantly write about her in pieces and parts and more and more writing. Right? And for those of you who have studied sonnets with me in the Renaissance literature class, we saw that in, uh, as a, a, in Sydney and other sonneteers, similar kind of endlessness, self-generated endlessness of writing. And Breitenberg goes on to say, Petrarchism seeks a form of knowledge about the woman as other that always slash already remains elusive. Um, that always already is a very you know, um, almost a cliched phrase in literary theory and, and scholarship, um, meaning that uh, it's sort of a complex to explain what it means to unpack it, but it should be clear from its usage that um, the woman as other that Petrarch is trying to know, she's even before he tries to know her, the, the knowledge is, is slipping away. She's always elusive, the knowledge about her. Even once he knows her, the knowledge is elusive. Um, whatever he does know about her has already slipped away, and so he must write and rewrite and rewrite. So again, we see how what Breitenberg's doing is incorporating what we've talked about in the Petrarchan context to his argument about how male desire is impelled, is created, is fostered, generated by its own frustration. So let's take a brief review of this first half. What has Breitenberg done so far? He examines Montaigne and Petrarch within the context of early modern romantic ideology. What do they tell us about the way early modern people imagined sex and sexuality and their own roles within it? And he explores within these authors um, a structure uh, an expression of masculine desire, that the masculine desire is defined, is experienced, is portrayed in a certain way. And that is in this paradox that it um, derives its being from its own, uh, that, that from its, its own sort of anxious pursuit of uh, an, an endless pursuit of its object that it will never possess. So there's an anxiety inherent in desire um, and a self-generation um, inherent in desire. And he uncovers through this, this internal contradiction in masculine identity, that, that it, uh, masculine authority is always um, anxious. It's uh, anxious as a result of its very being. It must always be defending itself. Masculine desire is always anxious because it can never possess what it wants to possess. And that, yet that lack of possession is the very being of its identity, is the very uh, grounds of its being. And so he's uncovering this internal contradiction in masculine identity, the way it's described, the way it's defined in patriarchal culture. And then he traces that economy of desire. He traces this economy of desire that creates masculine desire and its tensions in these works. He uncovers this paradoxical dynamic. So that's basically what we've talked about in these first uh, 28 slides or so. Let's take a short break. Let's take a moment to look at what Breitenberg says roughly midway through this essay as he sort of sums up the theoretical position that he's been establishing in his discussion of Montaigne and Petrarch. The failure of language to correspond to the object of its representation or the instances where language is in excess of what it purports to represent, that's Petrarch, right, where he can't 
capture what he's trying to represent in language, or the language means so much more than what he, what he can hold on to. This failure of language underscores rather than obfuscates the condition of the desiring masculine subject in patriarchy. So the failure to possess woman creates more desire for woman. The failure to represent woman in words creates more writing. And this endless desire, this endless writing, and this self-generated desire and writing is the necessary precondition for masculinity. That's what defines the masculine subject in patriarchy. That's not a hindrance, right? It's not a failure of the masculine subject. It is the essence of the masculine subject. If we apply such an insight to love's labors lost, the often remarked upon split between the male character's words and meanings, something we discussed in class, is not so much a case of true identity gone astray, but rather the very condition of masculine identity in so much as it is defined in relation to woman as inaccessible other. So that is saying, insofar as the men define themselves in relationship to the woman, the woman that they're trying to possess, who is throughout the whole play, the women are inaccessible and unknown and unknowable. They're mysteries to the men. The men's, uh, linguistic verbal diarrhea, we might say, and their constant playing with meanings and their betrayal of meanings is not um, their failure to be men, but that's, that is them as men. That's the defining condition of what it means to be a man. In effect, Breitenberg says, Signs offered by the male characters do not reach their intended objects, nor do they achieve their desired effects. This split and frustration produces masculine desire instead of merely representing some wayward extra linguistic desire. In a sense, we might say, building on what Breitenberg's saying here, the signs are not supposed to reach their intended objects. The letters are not supposed to get to the, where they're supposed to, and they're not supposed to get what they want, which is a paradox, right? But it's by their failure that they produce the masculine desire that sends them in the first place. They don't represent the desire that that uh, the, the person ex is expressing. They are the desire, the misdirected language the uh the misinterpreted words the words with multiple meanings that is the nature of the man's desire not a failed attempt to represent it this masculine identity is created in response to or in, in counter to in contradistinction to female identity as breitberg writes masculine identity is established in the play at the very beginning when the men sign their names to a pact that unites the men in opposition to the idea of women as linked to debased corporality. So the ma male social bonds and their identity as men together, because you can't be a man without there being other men. To be a man is to be part of a group of men by definition. So the men define them, their unity through the rejection of the female and the female is linked to flesh and corruption. The king expresses this initial renunciation of physical desire in a metaphor drawn from military conquest. And Breitenberg goes on then to quote the uh, uh, and, and discuss in some detail some of the language used in that passage. So he's using direct textual evidence here to ex uh, to explain his ideas, to support his ideas. And what he's doing here is connecting the metaphorical imagery used the flowery language that Kim, the king uses, that it's military conquest, to the ideology expressed that no, this, and he's really what he's doing is taking the language seriously. It's not just flowery language. It's not just Shakespeare showing off, but the language of military conquest is essential to the ideas that the king is expressing about renouncing femininity and renouncing desire for the female form. 
that ideology cannot be expressed except in this very poetic way. So he's not just summarizing the language or not just saying, not boiling it down. He's unpacking it. He's saying, what is the significance of this particular metaphor? And as he says, initially then, the renunciation of women and sexuality requires the conquest of masculine desire. That's the explanation he comes to after looking at this uh, particular example. The renunciation of women and sexuality requires the conquest of masculine desire, and that is the grounds of male identity as it's built, at, as it's established at the beginning of the play. Then we get Armado's example, and as uh, Breitenberg says, he, discussing this example, immediately following the edict, what the king and the, his men have just signed, the play introduces masculine desire in a textualized and specularized form. And he's talking about Armado here and uh, the letter he sends along with Costard. And discussing this letter, he writes, Breitenberg writes, Armado's own prurient interests have been aroused as a result of having spied upon Jacanetta. So he's seen what he shouldn't have to see, and in punishing it, he his desires have been, or in, in uh, tattling on it, we might say, his desires have been aroused. The audience, who finds itself in a similarly voyeuristic position, hears of the sexual transgression through the mediation of Armado's letter and the king's voice. The taboo against displaying sex on stage is roughly parallel to the oath of renunciation. So what does this mean? Well, Armado's desire is excited by a sight that we can't see. We haven't seen Costard and Jaconetta doing whatever they were doing in the park. And it's also a sight that Armado was not supposed to see. So we're excited, the, 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 the Armado's desire excited by something and our desire as the audience is excited by something that was only reported to us. It's represented by the letter, by Armado's words. And of course, those are insufficient, right? It's, we can't ever get uh, enough words to represent the picture. And so Armado's verbosity, and he's already prone to this, his, their copious attempts to capture the subject, and his inability to possess Jacanetta, he can't possess her in the letter, he can't possess her in the flesh, what does it do? It excites him to further poetry, he turns sonnet. The verbal friction between men and women is also another uh, another example of desire being aroused through its deferral, uh, because the verbal friction both here, it, it arouses erotic desire, it's what creates the desire between the men and women, but it also replaces or displaces any actual um, physical intimacy. Discussing the initial encounter, Breitenberg writes, the women are represented as deliberately thwarting every effort by the men to utilize language as a purposeful, expressive medium. This is accomplished by a kind of mimicry in which the women repeat all or part of what the men say in order to dissolve or transform the context of the original utterance. So the women challenge the men's expressions, challenge what they try to say. Any, anytime the king says something, the, the princess turns it back on him. When the men then try to flirt with the women, their words are turned back on them. So they're unable to express themselves. And so here, Breidenberg is reading language as a form of intercourse. Again, a kind of deliberate pun on, on my part. Um, language does not merely represent the desire. Language creates the desire. It's not just a vehicle for expressing some desire that is felt by the person, but the person experiences their desire in the act of expressing it. And so the women's language here counters the male expressions, counters their male, their, their statements of meaning, and it frustrates their desire in some sense because their letters are not received, their words are not received and interpreted as they wish, but that in, uh, at the same time creates desire and creates further provocations by the men, further expressions, further failed attempts to reach their target, reach their goal. And so here, what we see 
Breidenberg doing in terms of textual evidence is he's linking the content and the form. It's not just what the women say, but the act of repetition when they say it. Um, because what does Rosaline do? She just repeats what um, Barone says. So there's nothing particularly poetic in the imagery or the language. It's rather the act itself. So using a different using the text in a different way as a different form of evidence not just for what's the metaphor what's the image what's the content but how is the language structured how does the text unfold breitenberg traces this process of the deferral of desire provoking further masculine desire um, the king's desires appear to have been spurred by having looked at the princess and having been frustrated by her wordplay and all of the men, it will be remembered, have fallen in love while still under the oath renouncing women and physical desire. In effect, the initial renunciation of sexuality, as well as the women's resistance, seems to have been the condition of their desire, as well as the basis of its continuation. So notice how he's using the text here and using the, the, the plot, the narrative, metaphorically, as well as literally. The first act of the play is the men establishing the edict, and that is both the literal basis for their conflict with the women as well as the psychic, the emotional basis of their conflict and pursuit of the women. So he's reading the plot here not just as a literal series of events, but as something that has its own poetic logic. Now this new generation of desire leads to a crisis. He talks about, uh, Breitenberg talks about the speech in which Barone, um, after hearing all of his friends express their love for their various women, where he accuses them all of breaking their oaths, and he says, when will I um, be tempted by a this or that? And he lists off a, a, a list of women's body parts that are not going to tempt him. And Breitenberg writes, Barone perceives the articulation of love in the form of Petrarchan conceits as a sign of inconstancy and as a betrayal of the relations between the men. The comic irony is that Barone delivers his claim to have upheld the oath of renunciation in the very terms of Petrarchan anatomization that encode and produce male desire in the first place. So in a sense, Barone is admitting um, in the way he says, I'm never going to find myself tempted by a blah, blah, blah. In using that very language, he's expressing and creating the desire that he's trying to hide. But here, the problem, what's the significant problem, is that the men's oaths have been broken. Their bonds have been broken. They are not men together any longer. So it is a sort of betrayal in that their desires have now drawn them out towards the women that they initially had uh, excluded and define themselves through excluding. How is this crisis resolved? Well, there's a reunion, and it's the reunion that Barone has just, uh, that, that the, they're in the midst of, this scene where all the men read their love letters. A second ceremony establishing male bonds is affected when the men read their love letters to each other, and that's what they're doing. They're all reading their love letters out to each other, even though they don't know that they're being overheard. Their collective renunciation of love at the beginning is now replaced by a collective pact formalizing their new status as others. And notice how, as we've seen with the men, one thing can just become its opposite very easily. One thing is transformed into the other. The oath to renounce women becomes the oath to pursue women. And their male identity is redefined. So... In terms of Breitenberg's argument, what he's doing, he's, again, looking at the significance of the form and the content, right? It's not just what's happening. It's that we have this repetition and paralleling of two events in Act 1 and then in Act 4, um, where they not only say opposite things, but the acts, um, because of their place in the narrative, because their place in the plot, transform the men and their relations to each other and their relations to the women. So it's, he's looking at the logic, the poetics of the plot, reading the events metaphorically as well as literally. Desire becomes redefined, and women essentially become redefined, from corrupt to pure, from a hindrance of knowledge to a source of knowledge. And this recalls Verone's earlier witticism when he had been challenging the edict and said, well, 
It's to know what should not be known. Breitenberg said of that moment, the original opposition between abstract knowledge and corporal knowledge has been dissolved by Barone's simple point that both are forms of desire for something unknown. Both are generated by the deferral of their objects of knowledge. So again, one thing very easily becomes the other as long as male identity is, is preserved and it's still uh, uh, male, ide male identity based in desire. Desire first for knowledge and purity, now desire for knowledge through women. This desire is redefined, and just as Barone had wittily spoken on behalf of barbarism at the beginning of the play, here, as Breitenberg writes, Barone is no less soaring in his praise of the new feminine ideal that justifies renouncing the oath, and as his evidence, uh, Breitenberg uh, offers the uh, passage from Act 4, Scene 3 that I've referenced here. And he writes, in the second agreement, women and male desire for them become the condition of all knowledge as opposed to male desire being or male desire for women being the hindrance of knowledge now male desire for women is the condition of knowledge it's their vehicle to get to knowledge in other words an ideal of woman now functions as the transcendent principle that guarantees the masculine pursuit of fame and honor indeed of their very existence so we've had uh, again a reversal um yet the masculine desire the masculine pursuit um, is still in place. Now does women become the vehicle for it as opposed to a hindrance to it? However, as um, Breitenberg points out, is there any transformation? Right? Even though the men have transformed in their relation to women, supposedly, what really happens? What's new? What's different in the world? Well, he notes that when disguised in costume, the men direct their attentions to the wrong women. Male specular positions of authority are again thwarted. However, as Boyette seems to suggest, by masking themselves as by masking themselves, the women have fueled rather than foiled the men's desires. So even though the men have transformed their definition of women, their desire is still uh, frustrated. And the frustration produces further desire. And that seems to be, again, the defining trait of their existence as men, of their nature as men, as desiring subjects. So this means that the ending of the play has a couple of different ways we can approach it. How do we interpret the play's finale? Breitenberg offers two different um, approaches to this. He says, first, the female characters retain a stature of independence and authority. They dictate the terms of any imagined future marriage by imposing a series of year-long penances on the men. This lack of traditional comic closure leaves the women as the arbiters of their own romantic involvements. So this seems to suggest that um, the lack of closure at the end of the play points to a kind of challenging of male authority, a challenge to male prerogative, that the women have escaped the bounds of the economy that is totally defined by male desire and have some sort of independence in their um, sexual and romantic lives. However, Breidenberg says that this, this ending of this interpretation is complicated by the fact that the end of the play looks conspicuously like its beginning, right? The men are taking another oath to dis, uh, refrain from worldly pleasures. And so things seem just to be repeating themselves. The structure of desire introduced at the outset of the play and sustained throughout is sustained rather than challenged by the play's lack of closure. That is the male, uh, the ma the male's definition as desiring subjects and their authority as desiring subjects over female objects is not challenged. That economy is still in place. It's just the fulfillment of the women's role in marriage has been deferred by a year and a day. So in other words, have things really changed? Have the women really escaped? Is their independence only temporary, only illusory? And he looks at the cuckoo song that ends the play as uh, emblematic of this 
non-ending. He writes, the association of cuckoldry and marriage provides an apt coda, for it suggests once again the way in which romantic love is construed by patriarchal thinking in terms of loss and fear. And more specifically, the reference to cuckoldry promises a continuation rather than a resolution of the power struggles that have occupied the play thus far. So the ending song points us to a future where this economy of male desire that is built on frustration, um, where male authority engenders its own anxiety and thus generates its, its own further violence, where women are defined as um, disembodied or excuse me, uh, dismembered objects of desire um, and corrupt bodies or alternately as idealized transcendent vehicles to knowledge. None of that has changed. It's only been put on hold for a year. It's only been paused. We're still in the midst of trying to struggle through these contradictions and the tensions and suffering and violence that they raise. As a final gesture, let's think about the conclusion to Breitenberg's argument and how it serves to put in perspective his project in this chapter. Um, one thing that he does with his conclusion is he impl answers the implicit question that are raised by his investigation, which is, uh, if this is a play that um, is about the tensions and contradictions in male desire um, and attempting to grapple and resolve those, does it resolve them or not? W or what is it saying about those? Is it coming across as supporting patriarchy or challenging patriarchy? And what his answer is, is that it's complicated, that it makes gestures towards trying to challenge certain patriarchal ideals, but at the same time finds itself um, trapped within certain logical structures that it can't escape. Um, and so it gives us uh, an answer um, while, while still respecting and acknowledging the dynamic, complex nature of the text and the fact that as a play, any interpretation is contingent on production. Uh, that is to say, uh, there's an infinite number of interpretations that can be um, uh, potentially worked through as a play is performed. Um, so any interpretation is always in some sense partial. And finally, um, he's overall throughout the whole project uh, placing and in this gesture places the text within the larger context uh, and in dialogue with other voices that this is one node, as he puts it, one um, element of a very complex sex and gender system in which questions about authority, uh, objectivity, desire, violence um, and female uh, uh, female modesty and female independence were constantly being debated and questioned, saying this is one attempt to deal with this problem that is, of course, much bigger than any individual author. So um, that's an overview of the article, uh, the chapter in Breidenberg's book. If you have any questions, of course, you know how to contact me. Otherwise, I will see you in the next video, and I wish you the day you wish yourselves.